All right, guys, uh, thank you very much to join me today for this session of the webinar. So today I'm going to be focusing on the keys to the successful remote alarm rationalization workshop. Um, I don't know whether you guys actually uh, <clears throat> get um, notifications about our webinars. So uh, my colleague, Patrick O'Brien, I actually did a webinar on a remote uh, HAZOP workshop. So this time I'm be mainly focusing on the alarm rationalization this time. And uh, and also for the remote workshop as well, because we all know that right now working from home and also keeping a safe distance in a way that in a way that's uh, social distancing is actually the norm right now in this surreal period of time. And uh, we actually actually gets a lot of requests about these kind of remote workshops in order to fit into our clients uh, a schedule because of the COVID impact. And uh, we do workshops for our client, for example, like Hazob, Lopa, and also specifically this time, I would like to talk about the alarm rationalization workshops. So I'll first give you guys a more general idea of what exactly is alarm rationalization first. And then I would try to share some of the challenges that I noticed when we are doing these kind of remote workshops. And finally, I would like to give some kind of a, a few of the suggestions about how to, how to actually bring up a successful remote workshop. So I know you guys probably will have a lot of questions. So, um, I don't know whether I have enough time today to actually have a Q and A session. If I do, I would try to answer as much as you can, as much as I can. But uh, if you guys have questions, just don't uh, hesitate and bringing up in the uh, question section. You can type in the questions. So even if I can't get to your question during the Q and A session, I will actually download all the questions you guys had asked and then reply to you guys one by one personally. So don't worry about that. And uh, since we are talking about Exeter, so maybe a little bit about Exeter and also about myself first. So I'm Paul Chan and uh, I've been in the functional safety for more than five years already. Originally, I'm actually from the Asia Pacific office. I'm, I was based in Hong Kong and working for the Singapore office remotely mostly and uh, I've been to a lot of different uh, different kind of workshops actually I started my career with HAZOP and SEAL selection workshop in South Korea it was a joint effort of different uh, nationalities like people from Philippines people from South Korea uh, people from Oman, people from Saudi Arabia, people from UAE, they, they're trying to build up some kind of uh, refinery, gas refinery in Saudi Arabia. And there were, and the owner was actually from the European side. So it was really interesting, a very international project. And later on, I get more into the actions of risk analysis like seal verification projects and also right now alarm management projects. And now a little bit about Exeter. We were actually founded in 1999 by several of the world's top reliability and safety experts. In fact, um, some of us are actually from Chuf, from TUV, and uh, we were not very happy with how reliability was handled in the industry back then, specifically in Chuf. Um, that, uh, we realized that people were really focusing on lab data rather than actually focusing on how uh, reliability is being applied in the real world. Because if you get just using lab data, it's just going to get, give you very optimistic uh, failure rate in a way that everything can be seal free. If you look at the uh, the seal uh, the certificate from our competitors, uh, even a valve body, simple valve body can can achieve a seal free with just uh, several several fits. That's just so crazy. So in order to actually to take to make the world and educate everyone to take safety more seriously, so 
we found that Exeter to help the guidance in terms of how we handle functional safety in the automation side, alarm management, and also cybersecurity. And Exeter is a very customer focused company. We are mainly divided into three parts. The first one would be our, we actually write, we actually have our tools, very powerful life cycle tools like uh, Excelentia. Excelentia is a tool that can combine all the IEC 61511 life cycle in. So you can do HAZOP, you can do LOPA, you can do SRS, you can do seal verification with it. You can even record down your own failure data, the field data that you have with seal data. So it's a, it's a very powerful tool. And of course, we're, we also have seal alarm, which, uh, which can help you guys to do alarm rationalization as well. And other than these kind of tools, we also, we also have the, um, we also have certification and assessment programs. Uh, we have personal uh, certifications like CFSP and CFSC, the Certified Functional Safety Professional and Certified Functional Safety Expert programs. And we also do certifications for instruments and equipment like doing valve bodies. And we also do, uh, like uh, a kind of a, a cybersecurity assessment for your system as well. And other than that, we also do lifecycle services like consulting work, like facilitation of HAZOP, uh, LOPA, or alarm rationalization projects. And also we can be cons uh, doing assessment to help you with your uh, factory acceptance test, FAT, and site acceptance test, uh, site S SAT. So now let's dig into the main topic today because we are focusing on alarm rationalization. And before I talk about how to conduct a successful remote alarm rationalization, we have to understand what exactly is alarm rationalization? What are the main purposes? I guess uh, for most people, when they think about alarm rationalization or think about alarm, they will immediately go to two words to ensure a safe operations. It's something related to safety. That is very, very true. And especially when some of the alarms are actually being used within the LOPA and HAZOP to take some of the burden from your SIS system. So these are, these are to ensure a safe operation for your plant. But other than that, it can also prevent some unplanned uh, shutdown and also different damages to the equipment and the process safety incidents. And uh, I would like to bring your focus on uh, operation here, because other than doing HAZOP and LOPA, while we mainly talk about all the safety incidents, when we do alarm rationalization, we actually are going to be more focused on the operation, how to ensure the operation is going smoothly in a way that we don't need to have these kind of unplanned shutdowns or uh, accident with the equipment or some kind of a process safety incident that probably won't, won't create any kind of a crazy impact, but in a way that is going to leave a mark for you during your OSHA assessment. And uh, the workshop themselves can also be a very useful tool to review uh, if it's like a brownfield project that it's an operating plant already to let the operator to think, oh, okay, well, what is it? What does this alarm mean? So why, what do I need to do when I see this alarm? So to help the operator to remind them and also to train them to perform their roles, if there is a more senior operator in the team and there is a more, um, a, a more junior operation uh, operator within the team and the, or the junior one can actually learn from all these kind of uh, a discussion during the alarm rationalization. Through these discussion, they would understand what kind of role that they need to perform and also maybe to understand the process even more. And of course, an alarm rationalization is actually required with for by the ISA standard with the compliance. If you want to be compliance with these standards so that it can help you with your insurance, 
that is going to be very, very helpful with that. And also because alarm, part of the alarm aspect is actually, as I've mentioned, is being used in Hazog and also being used in LOPA to take away the burden of the sieves, to take away the burden so that the sieves in a way that it does need that much of a seal level for them, so that it is actually related to the OSHA PSM, the OSHA uh, process safety management. So it is actually going to impact the regulations in a way. And um, as I've mentioned, uh, because alarm is closely related to operations, so it is also related to your product specifically. This is especially true when we are doing patch operations, a batch plant. For example, for a batch of um, a kind of chemical it needs to, uh, you need to produce in a way that you need to sustain the whole vessel to have a reaction for over eight hours. But, and you also need to keep the temperature up to uh, several hundred F Fahrenheit in a way. And then after that, when you go into the next phase, you need to lower the temperature down to maybe by 40 Fahrenheit in order to let the reaction mixture to cool down, to let the catalyst to stop working. So in that case, that uh, alarm can actually be a kind of indication for the operator to know and to go on to the next phase of the batch operation. So if the operator doesn't really get into the um, to move to the next phase on time, then maybe the product's quality is being affected and you cannot get a good qualify, uh, quality from your products and that's going to lose your operation and lose your money in the long term. So before I go into details, about what we are doing for the activity of alarm rationalization, I need to remind you guys about what exactly is alarm. Because for a lot of people, when they talk about alarm, they will usually just think of as something about, uh, okay, something to tell me, to uh, alert me of, to notify me, to do, to maybe uh, of a situation. And for a lot of the operators, when they hear alarm, especially when they can hear a thousand alarm a day, they don't really care about those alarms because they would think that those alarms just mean that it's going to be like that, it's going to work like that. So in that way, that actually defeat the, the purpose of the alarm in a way. So therefore, according to the standard, we actually have very, very straight definition for alarms. Um, for the alarm, alarm is mainly to monitor the process variables. Process variables, for example, temperature, pressure, and flow rate. So these kind of process variables would normally be operating and frustrating, uh, frustrating within the normal range right here. But whenever there's an abnormal situation, then the PV, for example, the pressure here, it would climb, climb up, up to the point that it's abnormal. So then the system, the control system, will sound an alarm to alert the operator that, okay, that something is going wrong. And then the operator need to diagnose what is actually going on and what is the source of the upset so that they can actually do appropriate actions in order to prevent something that would actually happen. So if the operator does something, then the PV, the pressure, for example, here, will gradually go back down to the normal operation range. But if the operator did something wrong, or if the operator does, uh, did not do anything, then maybe it would go up, the pressure would keep going up in a way that it will lead to either shutdown or breaching, environmental breaching, or in, maybe even the, destroy the uh, design integrity of the vessel in a way that it might result in a loss of containment. So that is the thing that we need to prevent using an alarm. And the basic le logic behind is in a way being demonstrated very clearly through this graph right over here. 
Therefore, each alarm is important. If there is no response, there is no action, or maybe the action is ineffective to remove the abnormal source, the source of upset, then something really bad will happen, and that something very bad would be the consequence here. Therefore, according to the standard, the an alarm should always be something that's audible or visceral that is going to alert, to catch the attention of the operator and to indicate to the operator that there is something that's going wrong, whether it is equipment malfunction, whether there's a process deviation. It is going, it is something that's abnormal in a way that the operator needs to do something and also needs to do something in a timely manner. If it doesn't need to do something within a within like uh, within a day, then that doesn't really actually means that it's actually require a timely response. So in those cases, somehow we might not even need this as an alarm. And there are things that are different than alarms in a way that they can be stuff like alert messages or prompts. So whether this alarm, it really depends on whether there's an action that's being required. And also whether that the situation is abnormal. If they're both bingo, then it is an alarm. But if it's a, a normal situation, but there's no operate, no action the operator can actually do, or there's uh, uh, operation, uh, the operator can do something, but it doesn't really need it, need him or she to do anything until a month afterwards. Then it can. It can only be an alert in a way that it doesn't really need to take up that alarm thing because already we have a lot of alarms right there in a the situation right now. And if if it's something that needs to be done, but it is expected, for example, it's expected to happen during shutdown or during startup, then it can only be a prompt instead of alarm. Then if there it is an expected situation and also there's no action that's actually required, then it probably it's just a message, a message for the operator. So right here, I'd like to uh, do a very basic analogy towards uh, the idea of a sieve. For those of you guys who are in the functional safety world, you would know about how a sieve is constructed. A sieve is always constructed uh, consisting of a sen uh, sensors, logic solver, and final elements. And in a way, how the operator is going to respond to alarm is actually very similar. The sensor detects something that's going wrong within the process, and then it will relay the information to the logic solver that the logic solver needs to do something. So in a way that you will relay the action towards the final elements, for example, the final elements of a valve, then it needs to close the valve or open a valve, or maybe when the final elements is relayed towards the pump or to the uh, the variable frequency drive or the pump, then it, maybe it's just to stop the contact, stop the pump running. So in a way that when the operator see alarms, it detect the alarm, and then it would diagnose the situation right over there, very similar to a logic solver. And then it would try to respond. By respond, we don't mean that we just click the silence uh, silence button. By response, we mean that we are doing something. There's something we need to we need to take actions. For example, uh, trend the set point of the particular valve. That would be an action. So in a way, this is how. Very similarly, the operator response is very similar to a sieve's action. And uh, because we are actually uh, engaging in human interaction uh, in here, so how how many alarms can actually an operator respond within a ten minute a ten minutes period? I'm, I've been hearing stuff like a hundred or two hundred, but if we look at uh, what being guided within the standard. There's a, another story with it. So right now we list the two very, uh, very popular standards that are being used. The ISA standard is being used in the US and the EMUA standard is being used in the European 
union. And uh, both standards are very similar. Uh, it's just uh, sometimes it's just a difference between different languages and also a very minor uh, difference between the usage of words or the usage of vocabulary and very minorly uh, some regulations as well. There is also an IEC standard for alarm rationalization, um, but since, again, it's very similar to these two standards, so I'm not going to list them here. So uh, according to the standards, uh, we should only uh, contain most of the alarms to 150 to 300 a day. But what's actually happening right there especially in the petrochemical and power industry that you have even 1,500 or 2,000 alarms per day. And you have more than like six, nine, eight alarms within 10 minutes intervals. But from the standards, they only advise that you can only have um, around, in average, about one to two alarms per, per one or 10 minutes uh, interval. So in a way that it, the situation right now can actually create an alarm overload for a lot of the operators out there. They can't really handle that many alarms. And uh, for the peak alarms, so that means that within the 10 minutes, there are a maximum how many alarms that actually come in. So the standard advise you guys to minimize, uh, limit it to about 10 only, and less than 10, ideally but the situation out there could be more than 200. So in a way that if you are familiar with the uh, alarm within uh, alarm list within the uh, control system, like for example, Delta V, if you have 200 alarms coming in within 10 minutes, you can't really display all of them, first of all. So definitely there are more than, more than I would say 90 alarms that are being or even more than 100 alarms being ignored immediately. So in a way that this is a situation which we call them as, and label them as alarm flood situation. And this is very dangerous because a lot of the craziness, a lot of the uh, crazy situation that has happened, um, to, uh, that's due to alarm failure is because of this. Um, for example, the, um, the horizon, there, there was a movie about it where the, there was an oil rig on the sea platform that uh, because of the crazy flood or alarm and the operator that didn't know how to, what to do and what, how to tackle the problem. So that resulted in a, result in a very, very horrible fine for BP and also in a way that it destroyed the whole ecosystem right over there, eco marine system, because of the leak of the oil and everything. And one more thing that's very, very, uh, very nuisance in a way that is something called standing alarms. Um, these alarms that could be always there for like 365 days. So I was in a oil refinery um, in Pennsylvania and I saw an alarm it was standing there for 400 days. And the operator, and actually no one could understand what exactly that was for, in a way that they, even a control engineer didn't know. So these would be the alarms that actually take up the space, take up the view from the list in a way that, okay, what, what am I doing with these? And these will be the nuisance alarms. Since if you don't really know what to do with them, how, why do you need them in a way, right? And the, according to the standards, we better to control it, especially for the ISA standard to limit it, everything to less than five right over there. And the other thing that's very, very important would be the problem with priority. Um, if you're familiar with the control system, each control system is different, but they always have a kind of a priority assigned to the alarms. For example, priority of a high alarm and priority of a low alarm. In a ideally, in an ideal world, when you see a high alarm and a low alarm popping up at the same time, you have to deal with the high alarm first because it's of a higher priority. But then, in the real world situation, what we can see is that the there are far more high priority alarms than the low priority alarms. So everything is high in priority. So when you see a lot of the alarms that being popped up, then you see most of them are high, high priority, so you don't really know how to handle them in a better way. 
So according to the standard, the distribution themselves needs to be controlled in a way that's very similar to a pyramid, with the lower priority taking up most portion of the alarm, the medium taking up the middle part, and the high priority taking up only the tip of the pyramid. So that's the main problem we see right now with the industry when it comes to alarm problems. And that is why we need standards. This is the ISA standard on alarm management life cycle. If you're familiar with all these kind of a risk related life cycle, uh, risk related uh, standards, you will know that there would be a life cycle in nearly everyone, in every one of them. Like the functional safety, they have a life cycle there. Uh, cybersecurity, they also have a life cycle there. And and also maybe uh, IT security, they also have a life cycle there. So because uh, we can see that for engineering work, we always have a life cycle. And there's a reason for that, because life cycle means it's alive. It means that it takes care of how we handle this pro uh, subject in a lifetime of your plant, of how you're going to handle the whole situation project. So it starts out here for alarm management using the idea of a philosophy. You need to draft your own philosophy. The philosophy is to dictate the guidelines, the practices, and the procedures for your specific alarm system. Therefore, philosophy document should be tailor-made to your own control system. It's not something that um, that's going to be something that's, uh, that's like a standardized in a way that we can stamp it into every every part of the industry. No, it has to be tailor-made and discussed with a specific uh, integration with your control system and how you're going to handle according to your situations. We provide that kind of guidance. We do have template, but we usually all organize a workshop with you guys um, in order to discuss how you want to handle your alarm system. It's about one or two days to finish everything. And then um, we can identify these kind of alarms and then we can start the rationalization process. For the rationalization process, we will going to determine which of the alarms are actually valid or necessary. And then we establish the design settings, the priorities, the limit, and try to document the basis for why these alarms are valid. What's the cause? What's the consequence of the alarm? What's the corrective action for the alarms? What would be the time to respond to these alarms? And since we're going through each of the alarm for every one of them, so when you finish the rationalization, you actually will have a database of all the alarms in a way that all of them are rationalized and we call them a master alarm database. So after finishing this master alarm database, we single out those alarms that might need some special attentions. For example, during uh, like, let me give you an example, like uh, during startup, you know that there will be a series of alarm that would come up in the, on the screen uh, spontaneously in a way that uh, there's one particular alarm that would come in first. So then you can actually do some kind of advanced alarming design in a way that you only, during, during startup, you only see when you see this alarm pop up, the first one alarm that would pop up, then you will automatically silence the rest of them. So these kind of advanced alarming design actually needs good integration with your control system because for some of the control systems that they can't really do that. So it needs a good uh, design, needs a good uh, control engineering as well to actually program the whole alarm in a way. And we also will look at the design of your human machine interface, the HMI design, whether the alarm is being shown nicely, whether there's audible, whether the you might, because there are a lot of people that are colorblind with it. So are you actually showing, uh, alerting people in a way that you're using a red or green color that maybe some of the operator, they can't really distinguish that. And, um, so we need to find, we need to look at these kind of design in details. And then after uh, we have drawn through 
these kind of designs, we go through the implementation process. We try to pull these alarm and upload them back to the control system. After uploading them, then we go into the operation phase and also the maintenance phase. We try to monitor it, we try to assess it, we look at different KPIs, the key performance indices, and then we try to identify whether there are some new issues within the alarm system. If we see something that's going wrong, then we initiate the management of change and then we try to review and authorize those kind of change by passing everything back into rationalization process to review what's actually going needs to be reviewed during rationalization process. And that's why it is a cycle. You can see this is a cycle that's going on and on, and in a way that it is a positive feedback so, uh, loop. This loop is positive feedbacking because you see all these information being feeded back into the loop, but in a way that is going to improve your system more and more and continuously. So as time go by, as you keep on going through this loop, more information would be available to you. More improvement would be done for the system. So less of a problem will be caught by the monitoring assessment and also the audit problem. So in a way that it's going to make you a better life and also going to make an uh, operator's life much better as well. So that's the basic idea of the alarm management life cycle. And today we're going to mainly focus on rationalization. And uh, because of the limited time that I have, I would very likely touch on what is doing to be discussed during rationalizations. So, um, but there are a lot of stuff being can be discussed for rationalization. In fact, the whole alarm calls can take up up to three to five, uh, three to four days uh, for eight hours nonstop when we talk about uh, alarm management. Therefore, uh, if you guys uh, are very interested in it, uh, please consider going to our website and considering going to uh, the, our academy, as we put it. Uh, that we have online courses for alarm rationalization. So, what exactly entail within the alarm rationalization process? The main idea to actually to get to the alarm rationalization is to check these alarms, whether they are valid or not. And by that, we will determine whether there's a consequence of inaction, whether there's going to something that's happened if the operator does not do anything. The consequence here is very different than the consequence that we use in Hazard. Because when we talk about the consequence in Hazard, we try to throw away all the safeguards. But here we are just going to talk about what's immediately going to happen if the alarm is ignored. That which, which usually is either a process trip or a, a SIS trip. Therefore, and that would be something that we want to prevent, but in a way that that also means that uh, the situation won't be that severe. And other than the uh, consequence of inaction, we're also going to document the cause. We try to pinpoint the source of the upset, and we try to confirm it. For example, if there's a level alarm, high level alarm, then maybe the operator can go to the vessel and look at the side glass and to confirm whether the level level is actually rising. And then there's something that needs to be done to actually solve the problem. And we need to document that very clearly by, for example, right now here we might be, we open up some of the valve downstream, or maybe we close down a trend, a close down, a pinch the valve uh, that's going to lead and supply to the level to the vessel in a way. And then we're also going to document what within what time limit does the operator needs to actually needs to respond. And here's a very funny thing. In a way that uh, I've seen when I was doing some kind of alarm work in uh, in South Korea, I saw something that they listed the operator response time to be 10 seconds. That is impractical. And in a way that in that case, then you probably shouldn't, you should not need, need alarm right here. You need an alarm that's upstream 
that's going to you can handle it have more time to handle it upstream than having alarm right here in a way that you probably going to blow up uh, anyway that if you only have 10 seconds to respond to it when the alarm is actually sounded so all these uh, criteria is what we call the alarm knockout criteria because if we find now that there's no action needs to be done we can't pin if we can't pinpoint the cause if we can't have any kind of actions or maybe the operator response time is impractical then we can just lock out the alarm we don't need the alarm and we may have other kind of alarm in other places to actually handle the situation and after we f we if we think that this alarm is needed we have filled in all these kind of information then we will look at a priority and assign the right priority for it and then try to have the right alarm classifications like whether it is a safety alarm whether it's related to personnel safety whether it's related to environmental and stuff like that because you have if you have different classifications you have different way of maintenance to handle these kind of alarms as well and then we also try to determine the set point for these kind of alarms and then we try to rem verify what are the remaining attributes of the alarms um, uh, for for example whether there is some kind of a special handling that we actually needed to be flagged that we need to do it afterwards at the alarm um, uh, after the afterwards at the design a uh, detailed design situation and um, yep for the special handling and of course for the alarm rationalization we need a whole team and also we need the facilitator at least and sometimes we do have scribe for that and we have our own seal alarm tool to actually help you guys to do it so this would be the stuff that we actually go through in details during the rationalization process we review all the alarms against the criteria that are actually listed in the alarm philosophy document that's being set out and then we fill in all the blanks whether there's a uh, consequence of no actions what would be the alarm message being shown on the screen to the operator whether there be the causes the comment the confirmation and etc these kind of informations so um in the standard uh, how we identify or how we define these kind of information would be something that goes into the control system and be shown uh, as an alarm response menu. In Delta V specifically, we call it an alarm help. So if there's an alarm that's being enunciated within the system, the operator can click on it and then look at the all these kind of information to know uh, what should be done for this alarm when you see this alarm coming in. So these, these will be stuff that we go in. And we also look at the limit, priority, and then formulate the master alarm database. And uh, the priority. The priority is a very, uh, I would say, there's some a concept that people usually get mixed up. Because priority, Usually when people think about high priority, that's, that means that's something that's related to either uh, personnel safety or something that we need to look at it very quickly. So we, we should th we think about that. But in a way that how the standards define it is actually going to take into both ideas, both ideas of the severity of the consequence and also the urgency for the operators to respond. For example, for for some alarms that's related to fatality, if you don't do anything that it might have explosion and result in fatality, it has a very severe consequence right here, but you actually have time to respond it. Maybe um, you have 15 to 30 minutes to respond to it. Then you're actually going to result in a warning priority, which is the, usually the middle priority so you don't extend essentially end up with a high priority right over there so that is why we need these kind of matrices to deal with the prioritization and of course our tool has it um, we can do the priority right very well right over there and also within the seal alarm we also have a tool that uh, we can determine the set point over there um, because within the standard, they're actually going to use a graph to trend 
to actually trend you based on the response time to trend it to what would be the uh, the optimum alarm limit in a way um, although i do understand this for some of the operator they actually prefer to just call it the number and that is nothing wrong with them because they they might actually want to do it in their way in a way that is uh, better for them to handle the whole process so but the uh, seal alarm has to has the capability to actually do some calculations right over there. Um, so for the alarm rationalization team, usually we need full-time people there. The full-time people there would be production, uh, process engineers, and operators, at least two of them, from different shifts. And also we need control engineers over there because for some of the alarm, we can have alarms like command 101. We have no idea what those are. So we need control engineers to see how actually the alarm is being programmed. And um, we also need of uh, the alarm management facilitator or the scribe over there. And there could be part-time people as well, like safety and environmental people, uh, maintenance or instrumentations uh, or management people to let them know how important it is to have alarm rationalization. And although we try to keep the people as uh, as fair as possible, in a way that we don't really going to overrun everything, but we do need the essential people right over there to actually ensure a smooth operation of everything. So, um, what would be the benefit for a remote workshop right now? So. Because we, we do have a lot of requests for a remote workshops, because right now we can't do a lot of the traditional workshops, mainly because of the COVID situation. And uh, I am really uh, sad to, to know that yesterday in the US, there's the, the highest number of hospitalization here, and also the highest number of deaths per day here as well. So this is something that's real. That's not something that's a hoax. That's some, something that's out of a thin air. So we have to take it seriously. And that's why we need to have these kind of remote workshop to handle it. And also because, um, well, last year we actually engaged in a project with one of the gas refinery, natural gas refinery in Louisiana, um, in a way that uh, they were actually trying to build a new gas plant in Louisiana and uh, but we finished the hazard from for them halfway, kind of. Uh, we do have a little bit more need to be done, but because of the COVID situation in the beginning of this year, we have to actually, actually had to stop all the traditional workshop. So right now we're actually doing the remote uh, hazard and also alarm rationalization for them so that they can keep up with the existing project schedule in a way that they can start operating very soon. And also, it can help them to stay within the current revalidation timeframe because for insurance purposes, they have to do the alarm rationalization process. And also to file for FERC, which is related to the environmental side, uh, related to uh, the, the operating uh, licenses that they need to start operations, they actually need to finish their hazard and also some, something, something that's related to alarm rationalization. So by doing these kind of remote workshop, it can actually help them to achieve that problem. And also right now, because of a remote workshop, there's higher flexibility with the scheduling because we don't need to ship in people to a particular point of entry or particular point of venue at a certain time. And it can also reduce the cost of the workshop in a way that we don't need to fly in people. It can also limit the trouble that's required and we can ensure that we can have the same rigorous extent of analysis in the long way as well. But of course, there are these kind of challenges that we can face when we do these kind of remote workshops. I would like to divide them one side to the physical sides. The other side would be something related to the communication related to the psychological side. Um, for the physical side, the first thing would be the lack of multiple screens. And that is a very big problem. Um, it usually happens for uh, at the client side, um, they don't have enough screens 
But the problem is that we need to show more than two documents or two screens at the same time, because we, first of all, we need to show what is being typed into the alarm help, what is being typed in the worksheet or in the seal alarm specifically. And the other thing we need to have is at least the PNID or the HMI in a way that we can indicate the process that we are on to right now. So we need to show at least two documents, but sometimes we also need to look at AVDs, the alarm philosophy documents, the different policies, or maybe the alarm report, the KPI, the key performance indices that's being shown and regenerated from the control system. Um, so these stuff are usually very important and we have to, because we need to show them spontaneously. So uh, a lack of screen can be a big problem when we try to run these kind of workshops. And the other thing would be the lack of whiteboard. Um, the whiteboard is usually being used as something we call a parking lot during the discussion. We try to park issues that we can't handle at the moment. For example, we don't understand what this alarm means as because it's being labeled as SIS 101. Then we need to wait for the maintenance people, or maybe we need to wait for someone to actually program the control system to actually feed us back the information. But if we do not have a parking lot, then maybe we do not have, we might not even remember about it. We, we get forgetful and then we, because we are dealing with about 100 alarms in a day. So, um, Therefore, these kind of crucial information, we have to park them on something like a whiteboard. And so for some software, they can do it. But uh, for a lot of the software right there, we can't really do that in a way. And um, there might be some kind of information that is actually required to be circulated as well. For example, if we see this particular alarm that uh, is related to safety alarms and we cannot remove them and we actually need to flag them. But then um, these kind of things we might get forgetful again within the whole discussion because we have to handle a lot of alarms at the same time. So we need these kind of parking lot to park these kind of crucial information right over there. And the other big thing that I ran into is about the different time zones. Um, even within the US, there are four different time zones already. And I do get into people uh, that are a little bit upset with the lunchtime, especially when they are uh, a 12 hours shift for the operators. So, so these kind of problems can be even escalated when we are doing international calls. Uh, for example, my colleague, um, which I mentioned, uh, whom I mentioned, uh, Patrick, uh, he was doing, I believe he was doing a kind of hassle, remote hassle uh, for a European company and he had to wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning to do it. It is uh, horrible, but it is something that we have to brace it as consultant, I guess. So, but this is definitely something like a physical barriers. But, and of course, we can't really run it for eight hours a day then, because if we run it too long, then the client might it might pass their bedtime up to 12 a.m. in the morning so we can maybe we can only run for four hours a day in a long way since we talk about the physical side right now I would like to jump to the more uh, psychological side so the thing with communication isn't just about talking in fact it's more it's very very uh multi-dimensional, I would say. It's not just what you say that counts. There's an important aspect of effective communication of non-verbal surrogates, uh, which include your facial expression, your position of the head and shoulders, and also the gesture, how you use your hand in a way. And because a lot of the meeting right over there, for example, this one, we don't really, we can't really share our face in a way that is going to be distracting. But for webinar, because it's more one way, so I think, do you think it is fine? But for a discussion workshops, alarm rationalization workshop, hazard workshop or local workshop, it's more about discussion. It's more about communicating 
different ideas and exchanging different discussions. So when you don't show your face, that's going to create a lot of the situation for an effective communication. The first one would be the lack of trust. There is always the fear of a no because you don't show your face. You lack this kind of face-to-face -face interaction that would create intimacy issues. And um, it's very hard to create a meaningful interpersonal bonding. Therefore, people are usually more hesitant to actually speak up. And because we don't really know who is actually speaking, so it's very hard to know. Um, for example, whenever, whenever we ask questions, it's like an echo into the black hole. Then we wait for a minute to ask a question again because there was no response. And then the people might sluggishly respond. And I remember for the first remote workshop that we did, it took us four days to get everything ready. And day four was actually the last day. So we need to reschedule another session again. So it's very hard to incorporate the right information sometimes. And uh, also, it is more psychologically draining for the whole process because we, we hear more silences, we are less focused, and it is very easy to go down into the rabbit hole where we just have this encircling discussion about the same topic again and over again, but not really reaching a consensus in a long time, long term. And I also notice another problem is that uh, people like to leave the meeting a lot. Maybe because it's a virtual uh, environment that can create a kind of a perceived per perception of that you have a personal bubble and people don't really treat this meeting that seriously. And in back in the meetings that I faced is that a lot of was that a lot of the process and control engineers, they kept leaving the meeting and we had to wait them to be back in order to process all the information. So that is like, that was actually very damaging to the whole process, to the whole workshop. And I would like to make a few suggestions to actually tackle these kind of problems. First of all, we need to ensure, uh, prepare everything, at, especially at the client side, to make sure that they, they can show at least two screens at least one showing the seal alarm, the worksheet, and the other one would be the PNIDs or the HMI, the human machine interface, uh, which I would presume the operator would be more accustomed to, to follow on on the process. And the other suggestion would be, please, please know your equipment and also your software. If you're using Team Microsoft, if you're using GoToMeeting, which we are using right now, if you're using Zoom, know the functions, know how to share your screens, know how to share your webcam in an effective way, not to take up all the screen of your big face, but maybe you can uh, leverage it or maybe, uh, maybe try to minimize it in a smaller way that it doesn't take up the whole screen, but showing enough information for everyone using all these kind of documentations. Then also very importantly, get a proper microphone, get a proper headset or microphone. Do not use the laptop microphone because that's going to create a lot of echoes and that's going to damage the quality of the whole workshop. And the other thing is that we really need a very strong presence from the owner as well. Um, the thing with facilitation is that a facilitator usually know very much about how to handle things safely, how to handle things in client compliance with the standard but the problem is that the, the plan is owned by you. So only you know much about the process. You know how to handle the process. So if there's a no, not a strong presence from the owner in a way that we don't really know how the process is going to work, the, all of these kind of workshops would be quite moot in the long term because maybe the assessment might be wrong. And therefore, we really need a strong presence from the owner as well, in a way that we can also drive the whole process along as well. And I already I noticed that because culturally speaking in the US, people are more willing to speak up. And um, I, could rem I could remember when I was in South Korea, um, because also because of the cultural context and also the language barrier, 
it was very sluggishly slow to get all the information from different engineers. And it, that, was a, that was actually a big impact for the hazard for that particular session as well. And in a way that it was actually done in a traditional manner. I could only imagine how it is being done if it's like a remote workshop scenario. And the other thing that we need to do is to mark up your documentation and the PNIDs so that you can actually follow up on the process during the discussion. You need to keep track of the process of the alarm rationalization. And you can either use it like a physical way or use it within the software. Just try to tap into the software they're using and to know to be more familiarized with the process. And the other thing is to be aware of the tone. English or any kind of Indo-European languages, they have a big emphasis on tones. Um, if the facilitators speak with a flat tone all the way down, it's only going to create very unnecessary fatigue. And also it might send out, send out very strange messages. For example, uh, if I say, I'm happy, in a way that's like, I'm happy all the time, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. Then people might just perceive it as like a lip service and not really take you seriously. And this is especially true when phases are not being shown during the workshop. And also to combat the psychological drain, I would advise you some kind of stand-up desk, a cycling machine, we also have more bricks. And in a way that we also need to limit the sessions per day we have to have the right expectation from both the facilitations and also from the uh, owner size that this is going to be a slower process. There's no way around it in the long term. And we have to stick to the schedule. We know that we have to expect that it might start late, but we do not overrun the meeting because we are already dealing with like a hundred or even up to hundreds of alarm a day. There's really no need to create further fatigue after that. Uh, just stop at the right time, stop at the, uh, on time and let people go. And then we can refresh ourselves and keep on digging into it the next day. And also try to use a scribe nicely. Have a good division of labor, like operating the PNIDs, look at stuff, if he has or she has good typing, that would be very helpful. He or she should shoulder some of the burdens of the facilitator. Finally, I understand that this is a very surreal situation, and I just hope that everyone can make best of the situation right now. We have a vaccine on the corner, and uh, I hope that we can get a vaccine very soon, even though it's probably not going to be that effective, even though we might still have to wear masks, but in a way that at least part of our life can go back to normal. So that concludes my webinar uh, for today. I do have about one or two minutes left, so maybe I'll take one question. I already see a question right here. So um, there's a question about on which phase or stage of oil and gas design project is recommended to do the alarm rationalization reunion. So uh, I would advise you to do the uh, alarm rationalization after the HAZOP and LOPA because you will have the ideas, what kind of alarms is needed. And especially for HAZOP and LOPA, usually they would like to add on uh, multiple alarms during those kind of sessions as well. As for if it's like a brownfield project, then you some that's something that can be, uh, can be uh, kind of enforced or reinforced with the HAZOP if there's a management of change with that system as well. But it's something that's related when you see the audit or review, uh, when you see how the performance of your control system is. Usually after that, then you have to think about whether you want to change the configurations of the control system, then you will have to initiate an alarm rationalization in that way. So uh, I do see other questions, but uh, 
unfortunately the time is up so uh, please uh, if you have other questions type in your questions I will actually look at them one by one and re remember to leave your email or maybe you can send me an email through this uh, my email address over there and I will reply to them uh, personally and we also have uh, courses online that you guys can join uh, for all the FSE courses those would be the course those would be the courses related to functional safety and for the alarm courses they, these are the alarm courses over there so uh, these kind of courses will give you a more complete idea of how functional safety should be or how alarm should be so if you're interested please go into the, our academy and look them up we also have Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn as well. And again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email. I'll be always there. And finally, I hope that everyone will be safe from this uh, COVID situation. And uh, I hope that everything will become normal again. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'll see you again. Bye-bye.